Hey everyone, what's up? This will be our very first example in wind load analysis using NSCP C101-15 provisions. We will cover the provisions of 207E.5-1 for C and C type of structure. Let us read the statement of the problem. Determine the loads applicable to the highlighted truss of the roof shown in the figure. The roof is part of a residential building located in Baguio City. Assume the structure to be three floors, with a height of three meters per floor. Here, the structure shown also has its dimensions. The breadth of the roof can be computed as 1.2 times 6, which is equal to 7.2 meters. The length of the entire roof is 2.5 times 6, equal to 15 meters, and the height of the roof is 2.7 meters. As per the illustration, the roof has overhangs on both sides equal to 1 meter each. Now, as stated in Table E.5-1, there are six steps to follow. First, we determine the occupancy category of the building. Second, we identify the applicable wind speed for the site. Third, we establish the other wind load parameters. Next, we solve for the PNET 9 value. And finally, we scale the pressure using the appropriate adjustment factors. So let's start the process. In the problem statement, the building is said to be a residential structure. As per Table 103-1, the structure may then be classified under Occupancy Category of 4. The Exposure Category, on the other hand, can also be inferred as Category B since we already know that the site is located in Baguio City, a highly urbanized area. With those informations, we are now certain that the most fitting map to determine the basic wind speed of the site is using figure 207A.5-1A. And so, if we look at the map, Baguio is sitting in between 250 and 260 kilometers per hour of wind. We can either choose to visually interpolate the exact value, but since the exact site location was not specified, it would be best to choose the higher value, which is 260 kilometers per hour. Now that we are done with the exposure and occupancy category and wind speed, let us now identify or solve for the topographic factor. Topographic factor, represented by KZT, is computed by the square of the quantity, 1 plus the product of K1, 2, and 3. Be aware that there are some typographical errors in the NSCP version, so we must refer to the source, which is ASC 7 provision. However, it must also be noted that under A.8.1, KZT can also be taken as 1. If any of those five provisions were not satisfied, this would mean that in Baguio, KZT can be considered as 1. So now that we have obtained all the miscellaneous parameters, we are now ready to determine the applicable structural pressure. E.5-1 allows us to use a shorthand formula for pressure calculation, represented by P net value, wherein P net is the product of lambda, KZT, and P net 9. P net 9 is a tabulation of values of precalculated pressure for a standard 9 meter tall structure in an exposure category B site building while lambda is known as the height and exposure adjustment factor, which, as the name suggests, is a scaling factor for other building heights and exposure categories. So, let us now proceed to solve for lambda. This particular value can be found under figure 207E.5-1, which provides the necessary reference for our calculation. Before we proceed, let us first take a moment to examine the table so we can clearly understand the values presented. Notice that the smallest height value shown is 4.5 meters. This can be interpreted as the table indicating that any value below 4.5 meters, for example 3 meters, would be considered the same as the value given at 4.5 meters. Meaning the pressure from 0 to 4.5 can be assumed to be uniform. The same overall pattern can also be observed under category B. If we take a closer look, we see that from heights of 4.5 meters up to 9 meters, the factor consistently remains equal to 1. What this tells us is that the design pressure does not actually change within this range. In other words, from zero elevation all the way up to 9 meters, the pressure can be considered uniform. Finally, if we examine the highest height listed in the table, we find that the value is 18 meters. This is is indicative of the upper limit for what are considered low-rise structures. In other words, method E.5-1 is intended to be applied only to low-rise structures within this height range. 
Looking at the table, it seems that we must also solve for one additional parameter, which is the height. The height used for wind load analysis must be the mean roof height, often referred to as H mean. In this case, with three floors, each being three meters tall, plus one half of the roof height, we compute the mean roof height to be equal to 10.35 meters. This height falls in between 9 meters and 10.5 meters, where the corresponding factors are equal to 1 and 1.05, respectively. We now interpolate the corresponding factor for a height of 10.35 meters, and the result is approximately 1.045. Next, we will proceed to solve for the pitch of the roof, since it is another prerequisite needed for the calculation of PNET 9. We consider half of the truss, which has a height of 2.7 meters and a base of 3.6 meters. This corresponds to one half of the total roof breadth, which is 7.2 meters. By applying the tangent function, we obtain a roof pitch angle of approximately 36.87 degrees. We then match the roof type and the calculated pitch with the corresponding illustration provided in figure 207E.5-1. There are also other types of roofs shown in this figure. In case the roof type we are analyzing does not match any of the illustrations provided, we will need to select and apply another appropriate method to continue with the analysis. Let us now investigate the structure with a gable type roof whose pitch ranges between 7 to 45 degrees. In the figure, there are portions shaded in white, gray, and black. Each color represents the relative intensity of the effect of wind, with black indicating the highest, while white represents the lowest. The white portion is labeled as Zone 1, the gray portion as Zone 2, and the black portion as Zone 3. If we place the truss that we are analyzing onto this figure, we can see that Zones 1 and 2 are the ones we will need to consider. Notice also that Zones 2 and 3 are defined by the dimension labeled as A. The code defines A as the smaller value between 10% of the least horizontal dimension or 0.4 times H. However, the value obtained may not be less than 4% of the least dimension or 0.9 meters. This statement can be interpreted and expressed in the form of the following equation. We then substitute the known values such as LD equal to 7.2 meters and h equal to 10.35 meters. And so the outcome will be as follows. We now compare the calculated values. We opt for 0.72 meters instead of 4.14 meters, and we select 0.9 meters instead of 0.288 meters. And finally, since 0.72 meters is less than 0.9 meters, we choose the minimum value. Therefore, a is equal to 0.9 meters. We can now place the value of a onto the structure. The final wind contact will occur on the inclined top portion of the roof. This means that we will need to convert the dimension A into the corresponding dimensions on the inclined surface of the roof, which are labeled as B and C. Dimension B can be solved using the cosine law since both A and the angle theta are already known. The value of C will simply be the remaining portion of the hypotenuse after subtracting two segments of dimension B. We already have all given for PNET 9 calculations. We can now refer to figure 207E.5-1. And so here is the complete table. This table contains the design wind pressure on walls and roofs of enclosed buildings with mean roof height less than 18 meters for components and claddings. The table as shown is defined by the roof angle, zone, effective area, and wind speed. We already have most of the values except for the effective area. We trim the table and just show the portions we need. We still do not have the value of the effective area for each zone, so we will refer back to the illustration of the structure. Since the truss is located in the interior, there will be portions extending on both of its sides. Therefore, the tributary width is equal to 2.5 meters. The effective areas of zones 1 and 2 are obtained by taking the product of their respective lengths, B and C, multiplied by the tributary width. Now, since the tabulated values are not exact for our calculated quantities, we will perform interpolation to obtain the intermediate values. 
It is also important for us to recognize the smallest and the largest values in the effective area. If the computed area is less than one square meter, then we will simply use the value corresponding to one square meter. When the effective area exceeds 9.5 square meters, it means that the area being carried by the component is already too large. Unlike the case of one square meter, we cannot simply adopt the value at 9.5 square meters. The correct interpretation is that the effective area must not go beyond 9.5 square meters. Therefore, adjustments must be made to reduce the area, for example, by adding additional components to distribute the load over smaller effective areas. We have all of the input parameters. Let us now solve for PNet9. We begin with Zone 1. Since the effective area is 5.625 square meters, we will refer to the rows corresponding to areas of 4.5 and 9.5 square meters. Let us add another label. The positive pressure will be windward and the negative pressure will be leeward. Between 4.5 and 9.5 square meters, we now insert the zone 1 area, which is 5.625 square meters. We now begin interpolating the values for each column. Starting with the first pairs, if 4.5 square meters corresponds to 1.78 kilopascals and 9.5 square meters corresponds to 1.72 kilopascals, then the interpolated pressure for an area of 5.625 square meters will be equal to 1.7665 kilopascals. We will apply the same interpolation process for the other values as well, following the same procedure of identifying the two nearest tabulated entries and then estimating the intermediate value. So, after completing the interpolation for the effective area, we now proceed to interpolate the pressure due to wind speed. However, in this case, we must first combine the windward and leeward values together before performing the interpolation. Now, with a wind speed of 260 km per hour, the windward pressure becomes positive 1.9 kilopascals, while the leeward pressure is negative 1.96 kilopascals. Then we combine the results in a table to make a summary. It is now possible to compute the pressure for zone 2. We will simply follow the same process as before. This time, the effective area is equal to 2.8125 square meters, and we, we will interpolate the corresponding pressure values. After the effective area, we will also interpolate for the wind speed. This will give us the pressures 1.989 kilopascals and negative 2.4898 kilopascals for zone 2. We may also put the results of the pressure for zone 1 and 2 into a single table. Afterwards, we will convert PNET9 into the actual PNET value by multiplying PNET9 with the values of lambda and KZT. And then, in order to apply the pressure to the truss, we need to convert it into line loads or distributed loads. We do this by multiplying the pressure by the tributary width, which is 2.5 meters. We now apply the loads onto the truss as shown. Notice carefully the orientation or direction of the forces. As a simple rule of thumb, positive pressure is directed towards the component or wall and acts perpendicular to its surface, while negative pressure is also perpendicular but directed away from the wall or component. We are not yet finished. To truly complete the process, we would also need to account for the fact that the structure we are analyzing is a truss. This means that the distributed loads should be further converted into equivalent nodal loads. However, we will not be performing that step here since our main objective is simply to demonstrate the application of figure 207 E.5-1 for components and cladding in low rise structures. That concludes our discussion. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next example.